All right, everybody, let's, uh, let's get started. So before we, get, before we go into the content that we will cover today, let's first do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. So last time we introduced the VM interface. So for kernel, the VM is supposed to manage all the physical pages. The VM is supposed to give the kernel some pages. And later on, when the kernel returns the pages back, the virtual memory system is supposed to be able to recycle and reclaim the pages. And also, uh, when you deal with user processes, you often need to uh, play with the address spaces. And that part is, all, is also the responsibi responsibility of the virtual memory system. And for the user, actually, um, user won't realize any of the existence of these allocated care pages, free care pages, and so on. For the user, the user, the, excuse me, okay. Um, the only thing the user care, cares about is that when user get uh, want to access some patch, it will trigger some patch fault, and how the virtual memory system will handle that patch fault, whether to reject the request or to actually allocate some physical pages to fulfill the request. And finally, we have a syscall that belongs to the virtual memory system. It's called SBREG, which basically manipulates with the heap space. Um, so this is the virtual memory interface. So this is to the outside of the world, whether it's other part of the kernel or the user space, what the virtual memory system are supposed to do. And uh, we, last time we, we uh, studied DAM VM, how does the DAM VM fulfill all those responsibilities. So we know that the DAM VM does virtually no physical patch man management. When the kernel wants to allocate some memory or allocate some physical pages from DAVM, it's just called RAM steal memory, which just to steal the memory without ret returning to the, to the RAM. And so that's the physical patch management of DAVM. And for user address space, DAVM makes some very strict assumptions of what the user address space looks like. Right? It assumes that the user address space always have fixed number of regions, which is two in this case, is code region and data region. And the stack size is also fixed, right? Whether you are a tiny bin to bin force uh, program or you are a heavyweight fork test, fork bomb, it will allocate the same stack size for every user process. And it doesn't support heap, so there is no heap region, first of all, and we, there is no S break syscall support. And finally, DOMVM doesn't support swapping, which means that when it runs out of all the physical pages, it will just panic instead of do some smart thing like swap some pages out. So this is how DOMVM fulfills all those uh, virtual memory interfaces. Obviously, you want to um, improve upon that. By that, I do not mean that you can adapt DOMVM. So study DOMVM is helpful to get some idea of what the VM system looks like. I would suggest you, suggest you, when you design your virtual memory systems, you start from scratch instead of incrementally try to improve down VM. Because if you do that in the later stage, when you, when you do swapping, it's kind of very difficult to further approach the limit of down VM. So you want to start from scratch um, at the very beginning and have a, a good start point. So, this is what we talked about last time. Today, we'll mostly focus on the physical patch management part. In particular, we want to see how does the virtual memory system boost, boot, bootstrap. By that, I mean that how does the virtual memory system figure out how many pages are there available for me to manage it and all that. So we'll study the data structure here, which is very important in the physical memory management system, which is called a call map to manage all the physical pages. And then we'll um, look at what the possible state of a physical patch could be. And it's very important later on. But for now, it's kind of obvious whether it's available or not. But later on, it may have other state which you need to think, think of. And finally, we look at how the MIPS actually treat the, how does the MIPS mem manage, memory manage unit works? How does the MIPS translate all those virtual addresses? This is not necessary for this assignment, but it's very helpful for you to, um, when you work on this assignment, uh, for you to know 
when you deal all, all these virtual and physical addresses, you know what you are dealing with. So first, how VM bootstrap. So initially, if you think about it, you have this many physical pages, say four megabytes of physical pages, even before the system bootstrap, right? So you have this many number of pages, and when you type the command 6161 uh, kernel, actually the, uh, the simulator will try to load the kernel image to some part of the physical memory and start running from there. That's why kernel, that's how kernel uh, gets running. So suppose this is all the physical pages you get. You have physical address zero. You have physical address, let's say it's four megabytes. In this case, that four megabytes will be assigned to a magical variable called last p address. So if you look uh, at some assembly files, you may get some idea of what's the actual physical layout. In this case, this detail doesn't, doesn't matter much. But conceptually, at the very beginning of the physical memories, you have some exception handlers stored in there. So whenever, whenever there is some exception, the hardware will first set the EPC to some virtual address mapping to this region and start handling the exception. So this part you don't need to worry about. This is already been handled. So then after that, the kernel is being loaded to the memory right after the exception handler. Say the kernel size is like 50 kilobytes. Then this 50 kilobytes will be occupied by the kernel code, right? So the kernel's main function may be somewhere here, and the processor just start ex executing instructions from there. And in the, you, you, you already, at this point, you already know that the first function get a call when the kernel startup, startup is called the kman function. Right? That's the first C function that gets called. Gets, get, gets called. And it's somewhere here. It's kernel code region. And inside C main function, sorry, K main function, it will do serialize a series of bootstrap functions to initialize different part of the system. And you will notice that the first part that the kernel try to initialize will be the RAM system. And if you look at the code, here I have the main.c open up. So this is um, can main function, it first called boot. And inside boot, it first, the first function it called is here, RAM bootstrap, right? So it will, the, the first priority of the kernel at this point is to now is to figure out how many resources are there for me to use, right? If you go into the RAM bootstrap function, you will find that. So it first called the function called man bus RAM, get, RAM size, which is a, a low level function that provide how much physical memory are there available in bytes. And uh, so we do something. So here you can see that last IP address is actually assigned to that size. So if the size is four megabytes, then the last IP address is four megabytes. Then it will calculate the first available physical address. It's, it's very important to know that this first available physical address is not zero. As you already see in the slides, zero to, um, there are some portion of the start of the physical address is the exception handler. Uh, right after that, you have some kernel. So the first available physical address is actually after the kernel. Right? You can see that it's first free, which is a magic uh, symbol set by the linker and assembly uh, language, which indicates the first free available virtual addresses. And somehow it minus, it subtract that by this macro, which is K segment zero, which OX at the median. We will explain this, why you uh, subtract that to get the physical address. So now, for now, just ignore this part. And you have the last physical address, which is the memory size, physical memory size. And you have the first available physical address here. So now, when you do RAM bootstrap, you, you first figure out what's, what region of the memory is available for you to use, right? So this, is, uh, so this is what the physical memory looks like and what's the value of each variables right before RAM bootstrap or actually right after uh, RAM bootstrap because RAM bootstrap are supposed to initialize these two variables, right? So this is the physical memory looks like uh, after, right after RAM bootstrap. And you will notice another thing is that 
Actually, the VM bootstrap function is called at the very last of the boot function here. So after RAM, you have thread, you have clock, VFS, and all that. And finally, uh, you have VM bootstrap. That's not the last, but it's quite um, at the <coughs> late stage of initialization, right? So you will notice that be between RAM bootstrap here and VM bootstrap here, there are a bunch of other initialization functions, right? Some of them we'll call KMLock, which is in it, which is intuitive because when you want to initialize, you you often try to allocate some ma structure and then initialize them, right? So when they call malloc, at this point, the VM uh, system is not is not bootstrapped yet. So kmalloc will call get uh, allocate k pages, which is to uh, allocate physical pages to some other part of the system. And if you look at the implementation of allocate k pages. It will call get a p pages, which we call RAM still memory, right? If you go to the definition of RAM still memory, you will find that they just keep forwarding the first physical address, right? So uh, right before RAM bootstrap, the first physical address is here. So from here to here is the available physical address, physical memory you have, and then if some other function called kmalloc, which in, at the end we'll call RAM still memory. Then what the RAM still memory does is keep forwarding this first physical address, right? So this part is actually stolen by various part of the system, right? And when you reach the VM bootstrap, the first physical physical address will be here, right? So this part is actually stolen by we don't know what other part of the system. And uh, when VM bootstrap get called, this is what you have, right? This from here to here is the available physical memory you have. And it's very important to figure out where that is. And you already know that because you can have phys first physical address and last physical address to identify the region of physical memory that is actually available. So inside, um, inside VM Bootstrap, what are, you, what are you supposed to do is that you allocate one extra data structure which is called call map right after this stolen um, physical region. So this is, when you allocate the call map, this will be the last time you call RAM steal memory. You steal this amount of physical memory, and you store your call map there. And therefore, from here is actually the real uh, free memory uh, after VM bootstrap. So inside VM bootstrap, VM bootstrap, you will allocate this call map test structure. You will initialize this structure, and after from that on. Uh, the allocated k pages are supposed to work in, in the sense that the allocated k pages should stop calling RAM still memory. Instead, it should call your um, allocated k pages function, which consults the virt uh, call map data structure to figure out what's the available physical pages for, uh, are there to, uh, is available to, for me to alloc. So um, if you go, th go over this process, you will find that you need some information to know for example, inside k, allocated k pages, that a function can be called before VM bootstrap or after v, VM bootstrap, right? If that function is called before VM bootstrap, there's really not much you can do about it. You just do what done VM does, which is you call RAM still memory to serve the request to kind of give some physical memory for other part of it to use. Once you, uh, VM bootstrap gets called, and after that, when get allocated k pages get caught, instead of core RAM still memory, you should do some uh, smart thing like consult the call map to figure out what's the available uh, physical memory are there for you to alloc. Right? So you should have some flag to indicate that whether or not the virtual memory system has bootstrapped. <coughs> if it's not bootstrapped, then you just call RAM still memory. Don't, be, don't feel guilty about that. And after that, after VM uh, gets bootstrapped, you should consult the call map to allocate the physical memory. So this is how the physical uh, memory, the view of the physical memory changes in the boot up process. Any questions about this? 
So you first have some exception handler, you have kernel, then you have some stolen memory, then finally is some common structure that you allocated for the virtual memory system. Now after that, you have some, a bunch of available physical memories. Any questions? Yeah. Now, so the thing is, VM bootstrap, VM system rely on um, other part of the system. System, for example, you will want to synchronize the access to your call map. To do that, you may want to allocate some lock. For, to do allocate the lock, you you should have the thread system already working. Otherwise, the lock doesn't really doesn't really make sense. So there is kind of there are some dependencies there to force the VM bootstrap in that order. So you cannot just uh, bootstrap the VM earlier. So you don't want to change the bootstrap order of the boot function. That's very um, critical. So you want to try to accommodate that and do things on the existing framework. So this is the VM bootstrap um, process. So now let's take a closer look at the call map. As we already said, the call map are allocated right, right after the stolen uh, memory, which is here. So call map should be um, a list or array of entries, right? Each entry corresponding to one physical page. That's how you manage things. You allocate one small entry or small metadata for each physical page, and they store that metadata information in there. So call map is consisting of an array of metadata entries. Right, each entry corresponding to one page. And if you look at entries, say you have four megabytes of um, memory. And with 4K pages, you have how many pages? Four megabytes divided by 4K, 1K. Right, you have 1K physical pages. Then the length of the call map should be what? 1K, you have basically one entry for each physical page, right? So you have this one-to-one -one, uh, mapping to the from call map entry to the physical pages. And by mapping every physical pages, the translation between the physical address and the index to the call map is very easy, right? Suppose you have physical address, say 100, uh, sorry, 8K, then what's the uh, index into the call map entry corresponding to that physical page. 8K divided by 4K, which is two, right, zero, one, two. So the, the translation or the mapping between the call map index and the physical address is, is very easy or straightforward in this mapping, right? You have one-to-one -one mapping between the physical addresses, uh, I mean, the pages, phys best physical addresses, and the call map index, right? And because, these pages are already used by various other parts of the system, by except handler, by the kernel, stolen by our other parts. So when you initialize your call map, not every, every page is available, right? Some of them is already occupied by, uh, by others. And you should figure out how many pages are available there and how many pages are already occupied. But to do that, you can first get this first physical address which you have access to and then calculate how many pages are here. Suppose that 10 pages are already occupied. Then when you initialize the call map, the first 10, entry, 10 entries should be marked as used, right? And then the following entries are should be marked as available. This is how you, um, this is how the call map looks like and how you should in, initialize all the call map entries. Any questions on this? This may be a little bit trickier if you really think about it. So the, the, the length of the call map is straightforward. There's no doubt on that. Uh, given this much physical memory divided by 4K, you have the entries. But this part, I mean, calculating how many um, physical pages that is already being occupied is a little bit trickier if you think about it because uh, you have, first of all, you have some alignment issue, right? You need to align this first physical address up to, if, 
even even when the first byte of the page is occupied, the entire page the entire page is occupied. That's the first thing. And then when you uh, calculate the first physical address, you need to calculate the length of the call map, right? So that's some implementation details that you need to think about. But the general idea is that you should initialize the call map this way so that uh, after VM bootstrap, the call map reflects what's the, what the status of each, each physical pages, whether it's occupied or it's available. Right? Any questions on the call map initialization? Yeah. Yes, uh, the last physical address is the end of the physical address. It's a, it's a value, like for example, for uh, four megabytes. Last physical address there. Yeah, that's how many. Uh, that's how much physical memory you have. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we already talked about some of this. So how do you allocate the call map, first of all? There are a variety of ways of doing this. Uh, so you, you, you can first get a hand of physical, uh, physical address, first physical address here, and then manually increment that to reserve space for call map, or you can call RAM still memory, and that totally depends on you. This is uh, uh, some implementation details. And inside of the call map entry, so we have already settled down the overall structure of the call map. It should be an array of entries, and each entry corresponding to one physical page is to record the metadata of the physical page. Now the question comes to what kind of information you want to keep for each page. What metadata you want to maintain inside a call map, right? So first and foremost, what you want to keep is the status of the call map, right? Whether it's so for now, the status are quite simple, whether it's available or not, right? If we do not consider swapping. And then, then what? Pages, do you really need to, do you really need to store that? Like I said, if you do the mapping this way, giving a common index, how do you find the physical page? Or how do you find the physical address? Yeah, just calculation. It's the same that in the file table, you don't store the FD in the file handle because the index is just the FD. It's the same thing here. You don't need to store the physical address in the compact entry because the in given the index, you can easily calculate the physical, um, physical address, right? So that you can just uh, save some bytes there. And what else? Like I said, chunk size, what is that? What's that? Size of what? Size of page? Is, isn't that fixed? Then why do we, what's, so first of all, what's, what's the chunk here? Yes, so allocate K pages, right? Say I allocate four pages. You should give me four continuous pages, right? Well, you don't have to store the information, but later on, when I call three K pages, I just give you the start address of the first page. So how do you know how many pages to, to free? You cannot just free one pages because I allocated four pages for you. Right? You need to know, uh, starting at a physical page, how many pages is in the same chunk. So later on, when you do free K pages, you can free that many physical pages. Right? Then, because you don't know where the first page will be, because it could be any page, so you need to store this information uh, on every page. Or you need to set up, set, at least reserve the space to save uh, such information in every call map entry, right? In, in, in reality, you don't have to set the chunk size in every call map, but you need to reserve space to save the information. Got lost? Say I call allocated key pages, and you decide that, okay, from now, I want, I want to allocate four pages. You decide that you scan the comma and found a chunk of four available pages, continuous. Then you give the base address of the first uh, physical page. Give, give it to me, right? Where do you store the chunk size? 
in the in the first call map entry, right? Because that's what matters. You don't have to really set up the chunk size in the following three pages. This is not being used, right? So you only need to store the chunk size in the first entry. But but because this is the fixed size entry, you have to reserve a space for chunk size for every call map entry. That's what I'm saying, right? So later on, when you call 3K pages, and I give you the address of the first page, you can consult the chunk size in the first call map entry to figure out what was the chunk size you, when you allocated the, that chunk. So you can free that many physical pages. And finally, I listed some inf information here called owner, which is which process owns this physical page. For now, if you don't do swiping, this owner inf information doesn't really make much sense you probably won't imagine why you want map reverse map this physical page to some virtual pages. But later on, when you do swapping, you do need such information. For example, suppose you have swapping already done, right? You scan your call map and find there is no available physical memories. What do you do? You choose a victim, you kick out that page, or you don't really kick out that physical page, you kick out the content of the page, the content of the page corresponding to some virtual pages in some processes virtual memory, right? Can you just do that silently? What's that? Yeah, you copy the content of that page to disk. Then you can claim that this page is available again. But that content belongs to some process mapping at some virtual addresses, right? Can you do that just to do the copying uh, silently and reuse the physical page? Yes, you have, yeah, you have notified the owner. Basically, you have to update that process's page table to indicate that this page is no longer in physical memory. Right? It's in disk now. So later on, once that process access that virtual page, you need to swap that page back in to physical, page, to physical memory again, right? To be able to do the notification, you need this reverse mapping to find out that process, to find out where this page is being mapped to in that process's virtual memory, right? Basically, this owner information is a topo of address space, virtual, virtual address, right? Given this, you should be able to find out the page table entry of that process. Yeah. You don't need to? Do you need to? You have, inside kernel, you have access to everything. So there has to be a way for you to, given this owner information, locate that page table entry. That's your responsibility when you design your page tables. Yeah. So um, once you swap out a page table entry and you notify the process that it's been swapped out back to the queue, can the location of the physical page be the process? No, actually, notify here is a strong word. You don't actually interrupt that process. You, what you do is that you set some flag in that process's page table entry, right? So later on, when, so hopefully that process will never access that virtual page. That's the ideal case, which means you swap the absolute right page, right? If that process do access that page later on, he will find out actually because there is no TLB entry, TLBF mappings in the TLB, it will trigger a VM fault. Inside VM fault, you will find that, oh, actually this page was swapped out by me earlier, so I now need to swap back. So you don't actually notify, but just to mark that page is in disk. Any other questions? All right. So. So now let's talk a little bit more about the status or the states of the physical page. So for now, 
it's quite straightforward. Just ignore the dirty and clean part. You, first of all, you have free and fixed. Free means that the page is available. Fixed, you can, you can think of as the used. We use fixed for a reason. We'll see later on why we use the word fixed. So we have free pages, we have fixed pages. When VM Bootstrap is done, all the fixed pages is the pages that in the gray area. These pages are fixed in memory, right? These are also fixed. And there in the, we have a bunch of free pages, right? And the transition between the page states are simple, right? It, you first initialize the state of the, all the pages, whether it's fixed or free. Then whenever you allocate k pages, you can mark the pages you return into as fixed or used, you, as you, you can imagine. And later on, when the process, when some, when some, somebody call free k pages, then you can trans, trans, uh, translate the state from fixed to free again, right? So you, this, for now, if you only do physical patch management, it, it's very easy. Later on, you may have more state when you do swapping, right? A patch could be dirty or clean. The, def the definition of dirty is not what you would imagine. Actually, dirty means that this page doesn't have a copy in disk. So that's why when you first allocate a page, you would imagine the page is clean because I never touched that page. But the, the, instead, the page data is actually dirty because at that time, that page doesn't have a back co backup copy in the disk. So it's actually dirty, which means that later on when you decide to swap out, to kick out that page, you actually need to copy the content from physical memory to disk. That's what dirty means. Dirty means that whenever you want to sub, uh, swap out that page, you have to do the copy. You cannot save it. But once you do the copy, now you have two identical copies of that page, both in disk and in memory. So suppose user doesn't, doesn't touch that page from that point, then the status of the page is clean. Meaning that later on when you want to kick out the page, you can save the disk write. You can just discard that page content because you already have a identical copy in the disk, right? So there are some transitions here between dirty and clean, and this figure should be useful when you do swapping. But for now, let's just consider free and fixed if that's easier. And uh, so this is the page, physical page state. Any question on this? If you only look at the free and fixed, there's not much question except that why do we call it fixed? We'll explain it later. So this is a, just a side note that, of course, we need to synchronize the access to the call map because we only have one call map, the entire system, and the multiple threads are trying to access it. So, so which primitive will we use? Of course, lock, right? Whenever you have such um, shared resources and you want to enforce exclusive, exclusive access, you always want to use lock. And yeah, there another side note is that the call map should actually shouldn't take you more than two books. This is the third week after the assignment release. Is that right? Is this third week? Last week we have we have, we have design document. The first week we have midterm. Right? The third week actually for the, at this point you should have your call map already done. So how many of you have you finished the call map? Nobody? Well, you, sh you should have at this point. It's quite late in the, we have a bunch of other things ahead of us. So once, when you, once you, are, you think you are done with the call map, this is the test. You can be sure that your map, call map actually works. And it's solid. So we have KM1, which is a single thread KMLog stress test. And we also have KM2, which is multi-thread uh, KMLog test. You don't want to move on or work on anything else. If you fail any of these two tests. You want your call map to be solid, to be bug free, and uh, to provide a, a solid background or uh, for your other part of the assignment. So this is how you can test your call map. Any questions so far? You should really get, you should really get a call map done 
no later than this week. I will, I will put it this way. Yeah. Because I, as you could imagine, the swapping is a big headache. And that could cost you easily three weeks to finish. Yeah. All right. So finally, let's look at the mysterious MIPS uh, man, man, memory manager unit. Right? We have been talking about a physical address and virtual address all the semester. Now, what is actually a virtual address? What is a physical address? OK. So first of all, the virtual address space is solely de uh, de decided by what's the length of the instruction word or what's the length of the registers. In a 32-bit um, processor, the virtual address space will always from 0 to 4 megabytes. Right? You have that number of virtual um, addresses at your disposal. And the way MIPS uh, manages this virtual address space is that MIPS uh, divide or split the virtual address space into several segments. And from 0 to 2 megabytes, half of the virtual address is actually called user segment, which is, as the name indicates, is the, so user can use any virtual addresses inside this region. Right? Above that, we have two kernel segments. Actually, three, sorry, this would be k seg 1. So we have 512 megabytes of k segment 0 and 512 uh, megabytes of k segment 1. And finally, we have another gigabyte of kernel segment 2. These are just the numbers. Right? We have from 0 to 4 gigabyte this many numbers that's corresponding to the virtual address space. And now, when you come to the physical memory, this is really decided by how much physical, physical memory you have. Right? So in the sim OS 161 simulator, you may have 4 megabytes of memory. Then your physical memory or physical address space will be from 0 to 4 megabytes, each of them corresponding to one physical byte in there. Right? So this is the virtual, to virtual address versus physical address. Now, uh, so first thing I want to point out is that every address you manipulate in the, or the CPU try to access is virtual address. So for example, let me quickly jump to this. You have a bunch of instructions. For if you go to the assembly level and you look at every instruction, every address you issued out in the kernel is virtual addresses. You always access virtual addresses there, right? Now keep this in mind. And then depending on what that physical, uh, sorry, virtual address falls into which region, the processor will use different ways to try to interpret that virtual address. For example, here, whenever you have Whenever the processor, so think of as you se yourself as a processor, right? You have a bunch of instructions, and then you, you load each instruction to figure out what the instruction want to do. Suppose you, you encounter instructions say, I want to load the memory at this is this um, virtual address. And that virtual address is below OX at the median, which is from 0 to any number between here, right? So the way MIPS will interpret this number is that, OK, I have this virtual address. I will consult the TLB to figure out what's the actual physical address to use. Do the translation by using TLB. When, once I consult the TLB, suppose there is an entry there, there is a mapping there, I got the actual physical address. I use that to actually access the hardware, the physical memory. right? So, th so whenever the processor encounters a virtual address that below this OX at the median uh, address range. We always consult the TLB to figure out the correct physical address. This is what the processor will do when it gets a virtual address that's smaller than OX median. What if, so say I read the instructions, I say some instructions want to load memory from OX I don't know, at a medium 10, maybe larger than that, but below the OXA, seven zeros, I will not use the TLB. I will just chop the most significant bit of that uh, virtual address, and I use that as a physical address. 
to give you an example, say, Uh, I have an instruction call say the CPU read the instruction like this right the instruction wants to load the phys the content of the virtual memory at this virtual memory address how would you how would the CPU figure out what's the actual physical address to use No, that, that, that's the virtual address, virtual address you're talking about. When the CPU deal with up layer programs, we're always speaking using virtual address. So here, the programs tell the CPU, I want to load the memory at this virtual address. Right? Now, as a CPU, how would you actually get that memory content? You need a physical address. Right? This is how you interact with the physical memory. And how would you get that physical address? What's that? Did you not use the multi-significant Yeah, so uh, like I said, the way the CPU do the translation is that instead of consulting the TLB, which is different with user memory, it would just chop the last most significant bit. In this case, if you see the binary, it's 100, zero, zero, it's the first eight. You have a bunch of zeros, right? The way, so here it would be zero, 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 0001 corresponding to here, and a, a bunch of zero, zeros. The way CPU do the translation is that it just chop this last bit and set it to zero. And use this as the physical address to actually access the physical memory. The effective is like this. It's O x at media, one zero, 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 uh, minus K segment one, right? That's the, that's the constant, which is OX and median. You set this speed to zero is equivalent to uh, subtract this number by o OX and the median, right? That's how the CPU gets the physical memory. And uh, so in the previous slide, actually in the code, we see, we see something like this. The first physical address equals to the first free minus kernel segment zero. If you go to the definition, kernel segment zero is just OX and media, right? What does it mean? So here, the first free is the virtual address, right? It's in, it's in kernel segment zero. And we subtract uh, OX and media, we get the actual uh, physical address. Here, we are trying to mimic the behavior of the CPU when CPU encounters such virtual address. This is how we calculate the actual physical address of, of, the, of the first available physical address. Right. So this region, any virtual address in this region is directly mapped to physical. It, so say you only have four megabytes of memory, which means that only the first four megabytes of the virtual address is usable. If you issue a virtual memory larger than that, you will have some, I don't know what the fault is, but you have some hardware fault because you are trying to access some physical memory that doesn't exist. So this is kernel segment zero. Um, and kernel segment one is similar where you, all, you just do the subtracting or you manipulate with the uh, most significant bits. The only difference between the virtual addresses of kernel segment zero and kernel segment one is that uh, when you access the physical memory use some virtual address in kernel segment zero, the CPU will try to first consult the cache first. So this, this uh, data can be cached in the hardware cache. While if you access the same physical memory in kernel, kernel segment one, and you, the CPU will not use the cache. The cache is disabled. And you will notice that the same physical page is actually being mapped to two different locations in, kernel, uh, in the kernel virtual address space. So which means that there are two uh, virtual addresses that are being mapped to the same physical address in this mapping. 
So both kernel segment zero and kernel segment one are mapped, directly mapped to the physical memory. And finally, we have a kernel segment two, which is not used in this OS. It's, a, it's, it's kernel um, virtual address, but is using TLB, which you can leave it alone. Just uh, we don't use it in OS 161. So now if you think about it, you have every process have this four gigabytes of virtual address space, right? They have two gigabytes of usable user memory, user virtual address space, and every process's kernel set, uh, virtual address is identical. That's why when you get into kernel, you can, no matter which processes trigger syscall when you interpret into kernel, you are using the same virtual to physical mapping. Right. This may be a little bit trickier to digest at first, but keep this picture in mind is very useful when you deal with all those virtual physical memories. Otherwise, you will, get, you will soon get confused of when you are using virtual memory, when you are using physical memory. Right? And let, like I said, the CPU always, or the program always uses the virtual memory when the um, program wants to load some content from the memory. For example, if you have this instruction, as if you are CPU, then you, when you saw this address, you immediately know that, okay, this belongs to can current user segment. I should consult TRB for, to get the um, actual physical address. What if there is no entry in TLB? As a CPU, what would you do? What's that? TLB fault, right? You don't, you don't know what to, how to translate that. There is no TLB entries for you. We raise a TLB fault. And uh, so now if you have this virtual address, the, the hardware will know that this address virtual address belongs to kernel segment zero, and we just subtract that by OS, OS and media and get the physical address. And similarly, you have addresses in segments one and two. And you also will find two hyper macros that do the translation to mimic the behavior of the hardware translation, which is called a physical address to kernel virtual address, which is nothing but just um, add kernel segment zero to that physical address. You get a virtual address. And at this point, you should already, you should have some idea of, first of all, why kernel pages cannot be swapped out. When you choose a swap, swapping a victim, you have to leave kernel pages alone. Why is that? Not exactly, yeah. There will be no TLB before. That's exactly the reason. So the, the virtual address to physical addresses, that doesn't go through TLB. So if you swap that page out, how would you reflect the, the, the fact that that page is no longer in memory? So normally, when you swap out some page out, you also kick out the entry in TLB. So next time, when the process wants to access that page, you have a TLB fault. That's how you handle the swapping. Now, with kernel memory, there is no TLB involved. So you cannot really know that when the kernel access that page, because that translation is not done by TLB. You will not get TLB fault, and you don't get a chance to actually swap in that page. And secondly, why the LKK pages have to return continu continuous or consecutive pages? We know that for the user address, user address space, if we want to allocate four pages, the four pages ha can be scattered around all the, all the physical addresses. That's the advantage of using uh, the mapping or the page table. Right? But for kernel memory, we have to allocate continuous pages. Why is that the case? Again, we don't have page table. We don't have TLB. That's why the virtually continuous uh, kernel virtual addresses has to be also continuous in physical address. 
because we don't have the, those TLB stuff and, and patch table going on here, right? So this is how the MIPS um, virtual memory to physical memory mapping works. To summarize, we talk about this today. We talk about how the virtual memory system bootstrap, how to figure out how much um, physical pages are there available, how to initialize the call map, what's the status of the physical pages, and also how MIPS uh, deal with all those virtual memories. Okay. Next time we'll talk about user address spaces.